I'm pleased now to introduce uh, the interim president of Gonzaga, Thane McCullough. I'm very grateful that Thane has agreed to be here with us today and to speak to the importance of this work. Good morning, everyone. I have not scripted my remarks overly much, so you will not have to endure 35 minutes of, of uh, anything. <laughs> um, but I did want to let you know, I have just come back yesterday from Washington, D.C. It was a 36-hour um, adventure to Chicago and D.C., and part of the work was involved with meeting with the AJCU presidents at their biannual discussion. The presidents have so much to talk about that they've gone down to a three-quarter of a day meeting. <laughs> and uh, it used to be two days, so actually I'm quite thankful, but um, there is an issue with which the AJCU presidents, the other Jesuit presidents, uh, and I were concerned uh, in our discussions the day before yesterday, and it has some parallels, I think, to at least some of the issues uh, that are the focus of conversation this morning. Uh, in recent years, a question has arisen, and the question is about a concept uh, that's best referred to as Jesuit sponsorship. Essentially, the assistancy, the United States assistancy, which is the association of the provincials, uh, has been focusing on this question of what it, is it that constitutes a Jesuit work? How do we know the work, or in this case the institution, is authentically Jesuit? And the question is a good one. Uh, the catalyst for the question is, in part, uh, some shifts in terms of the society of Jesus itself. It's, in part, the decreasing number of Jesuits. Uh, it's also uh, some changes in focus in terms of what Jesuits ought to be doing. Uh, but the question has devolved into issues of power and control. The presidents, who already kind of compete with one another for who has the best institution or for what portion of the student population they serve, they want to maintain a certain degree of autonomy and independence, uh, even from the provincials. And that appreciates the reality that universities are separately incorporated, uh, that they have uh, unique and individual circumstances uh, with which presidents have to deal, uh, and there is the reality at every one of our institutions of a primarily lay-led board of trustees or some governance structure that is not comprised uh, principally of, of Jesuits. On the other hand, the provincials uh, feel, and as appropriate, I think, uh, charged with the responsibility for ensuring that all of the works that are under their supervision uh, are faithful, that they, are, that they have a high degree of fidelity to, to what is Jesuit. So, lest you think that this isn't an actual, like, real-life issue, I heard one of the presidents advocate actively that in their view, in order for a Jesuit university to be Jesuit, it has to have a critical mass of Jesuits working within it, and it also has to be supported by a Jesuit community. And with the rapidly decreasing number of Jesuits assigned to higher education, in practical terms, to support 28 discrete university communities in that fashion, uh, carries with it the implication, and he advocated that we probably need to have only three to five institutions that are called Jesuit in the country in relatively short order. The state of things thus far is that the presidents have proposed that we create a discussion paper. Now, the passive-aggressive aspect of discussion papers 
is that you wait the issue out until it blows over. Right? You can discuss things forever, particularly if you only meet twice a year. Um, but there really is an opportunity, I think, to engage in some important and substantive discussion around this question. And for me, who is a layperson with no vow of obedience, to any Jesuit provincial, um, I actually really hope this can be the latter. I think we need to engage around this question. What does it mean to be Jesuit? And what does it mean to be authentically Jesuit? So that, I think, illustrates that in many different quarters, we're having discussions about important things, but it points to the need to have a little bit of reflective conversation about what is this discussion really about? And put frankly, I know that this subject of educational outcomes and their assessment continues to be to some degree a, con a controversial one. So I wanted to talk just for a moment about that. Today we are here and you have graciously gathered once again as we have the last few years, to engage in an important substantive discussion about the assessment of student learning outcomes and the value that this approach begins to open up for our community. Now, we start, we run the risk of starting out, I think, on the wrong foot if we begin with fundamental misunderstandings about what we're here to do. What is the development of student learning outcomes and the assessment of those about? I want to share with you that from my perspective, we're not doing this work because some accrediting organization has asked us to or requires us to. And we're not doing this because the heavy hand of administration is insisting that we do it. If that's the reason we do this kind of thing, I understand why people have better things to do. The reason, I think, if we do this work well and effectively that we, we want to engage around the question is because assessment of student learning can, where it has been practiced, open up a lot of benefits and opportunities to do one thing in particular, and that is to help students become better learners. The purpose of the work is to help students take greater responsibility in this process for their own education. The work that you are asked to engage in today represents at least one important way of kind of living up to what I think is an ethos that we hold as important. We are defined by our own mission as an institution that teaches. At least it's an institution where I think that good teaching matters and where I think faculties come together to evaluate colleagues uh, in their teaching as a kind of a privileged component of the evaluation process. So, my experience and, and what I've heard represented is that we do and we want to take teaching seriously. It's a defining characteristic. What this community has give evidence, given evidence of over the last several years is that we're willing to engage in a deeper understanding of what's going on in this movement internationally and nationally uh, and that there is a great deal of support in the community for uh, serious scholarly efforts that support the improvement of teaching. Now, it's important that you know, that I know, that this concept of outcomes is for some kind of a dirty word. But it, it goes by many different frames or phrases. You know, it's code, student performance, measurement, or evidence-based teaching, or learning-centered teaching, student-centered teaching, learning assessment, okay? All of those have for me in common 
a very important construct, which is, again, that what our focus is upon is helping students to take greater responsibility in the process of this education of them. Faculty have responsibility to teach. Students also have, in this collaborative endeavor, responsibility to learn. So what is it that we as a community can do to help them to be more effective as learners? This endeavor is about attempting to help ourselves as a community to be more intentional as we look at what it is that we want our students to learn, to be clearer about, as a community, for ourselves, what we want that classroom and that educational experience to look like, and in the, in the process to become very clear, aware of what it is that will help our students to be more effective learners. There are those, and again, I think the heavy hand of accreditation doesn't help with this because it's often how these constructs are introduced to a community. But there are those who believe that the learning assessment approach to things really, at the end, just means more work for faculty and in some ways less for students. And that if students fail to learn, somehow this makes it clearer that faculty have failed. If we do our work poorly, then I think we allow ourselves to believe that that's what emerges. But if we do it well, exactly the opposite is what should emerge. The Teagle Foundation has now granted us uh, an additional four-year grant of $162,000 in no small part because it recognizes Gonzaga as a place where people are taking this effort seriously and they want to engage thoughtfully in it. And the president, Bob Connor, actually argues that this approach, and I quote, expects students to take responsibility for their education rather than leaving the burden on great teachers or good pedagogy. And Connor further sees this work as the pursuit of, and again, I quote, a long-lasting cognitive and personal capacities for students, and reminds us that there are really two reasons that we do this. Yes, there is a movement afoot at the federal level in Congress on the part of the American people to really understand what it is that higher ed is doing and how it can give evidence that it is fulfilling its own mission. But the more important reason is that when faculty are engaged in this kind of effort as we have been, they often come away from it with new energy, a sense of greater empowerment to their work, that it's a welcome change from a fairly mundane dialogue. Now, Bob Connor, Connors is a scholar of the classics. The approach that is being advocated for us to challenge ourselves around this framework, he asks us to recognize that in this process of higher education engagement, Students do have some rights. They have the right to expect consistency. They have the right to expect predictability. They have the right to expect transparency in the work we do. We do want, I think, as a community to move ourselves, particularly for the work that we do with colleagues who are not members of our regular faculty departments, but not because of them, to ensure that we're engaging in discussion so that students experience of what sometimes they testify to as bewildering differences between the expectations that faculty have 
between sections of the same course are better understood or made more consistent. As a teaching community and as a learning community, I think it helps to engage in this discussion because in turn it helps students to engage in their own learning more effectively. They have a clearer sense of what it is that's expected from them from the beginning. There's an opportunity for them early on to understand that the learning process is one for which they, as students, have responsibility and that they in turn can take appropriate measures to live up to this responsibility and that their experience of the assessment of their work throughout a course or throughout a program is uniform and predictable and fair. The student for whom expectations and the ways to achieve those expectations are clear is, the research shows, more likely to be engaged in the process of learning. I want to take an opportunity, first of all, to thank all of you for your efforts on behalf of this teaching and learning community to engage in these discussions and in this dialogue. I want to take this opportunity to thank the members of the faculty and the administrators and staff who were engaged in organizing today's efforts and activities, and I believe that you will see some interesting concepts shared as a result of this effort. I want to thank all of you who are going to be presenting today based on your thinking out of the Teagle research support. And most of all, your presence here is a sign that you take this endeavor seriously, that you're willing to engage thoughtfully in important discussion, and that this is truly a community that continues to keep students and their learning as a central focus of its work. I thank you, and I wish you the very best in your activities today. Thank you very much, Thane. I'm glad your plane from Washington, D.C. was not delayed. As Thane mentioned, we are in the first of three years of a $300,000 Teagle Foundation grant split between Seattle University and ourselves. That grant supports two efforts that we're engaged in. One is the exploration of an outcomes-based university core, and the other one is the work we're going to talk about today, which is assessing the effectiveness of majors uh, to begin with in arts and sciences. I've asked our colleagues to talk briefly about their thinking and the initiatives they're undertaking as a result of this work in our efforts to become, as Thane put it, more intentional about providing our students with the most effective programs that we can. The grant simply asks faculty in various disciplines to ask themselves the question, how do we know when we have a competent major? What does that look like? What does that major act like? What does that major do, think like, etc.? If in asking that question they discover that there's something missing, that their majors are missing something of that, then they go back and ask themselves where that might appear or not appear in the preparation of the major. And if it doesn't appear, how do we make it appear? The grant then asks departments to develop assignments that are embedded in the major, somewhere in an appropriate place in the major. And embedded means here that they are an integral part of what the students are engaged in learning, rather than an outside test or something that has no connection with their learning experience. And as you will see from these reports, this model takes many different forms depending on disciplines. Today we're going to hear first from uh, representatives of the departments of chemistry and 
history who were gracious enough to participate in our original Teagle pilot grant a few years ago. And then from the departments of biology, English, music, and psychology, four departments that are engaged in this work right now in the first year of the implement implementation grant. And I feel a special debt to the departments of history and chemistry because as the participants in that pilot program, they were our guinea pigs. And I learned from them how to write the successful implementation grant. They didn't get as much or as helpful support as the departments are getting now. So I'm particularly grateful to them for their essential role, as without them we wouldn't have gotten the big grant. So their reports may be a little different than the reports of the four departments engaged in the process now. So we're going to ask these representatives to speak for five or six minutes and try to get everybody out of here by 10 or so. And I'm going to begin by asking Father Michael Maher, the chair and associate professor of history, to tell us about that department's initiatives in the pilot grant. Thank you. And uh, as Mike mentioned, we began, our department had worked initially with Teagle and then a grant, and now we no longer work with Teagle. So what we asked ourselves in the Department of History Outcomes Assessment is, can we imagine a different and more productive way of doing outcomes assessment? What does assessment mean to us? And Michael Herzog sort of gave us that commission when he said, make outcomes assessment your own. So we did. We did it our way. And the first question we asked was, what were the basic questions of outcomes assessment? And basically we came out, what were our basic goals? What were our best means to achieve these goals? Uh, what methods can we create to make sure that we have achieved our goals? And then to close the loop of outcomes assessment, what modifications need to be made to the goals, to the means used, and for the allocation of resources. So thinking about this, we realized, of course, an important assessment perspective would be the Jesuit perspective. There's a picture of many of you know Father Patrick Lee, the provincial of the Oregon province, and a participant in the uh, 35th General Congregation uh, that was just held by the Jesuits. And in that congregation, uh, there was a document that came out and it said, indeed, any work may be said to be Ignatian when it manifests the Ignatian charism, when it intentionally seeks God in all things, when it practices Ignatian discernment, when it engages the world through a careful analysis of content, in dialogue with experience, evaluated through reflection for the sake of action, and with an openness always to evaluation. And that's from Decree 6, Collaboration at the Heart of Mission. And I took that photograph this summer. Uh, those are the uh, shoes of St. Ignatius of Loyola, which I hope we all walk in in some respect. So for the history department, Always open to evaluation uh, as articulated in Decree 6 of GC 35 equals for us outcomes assessment. It's that constant uh, attention to evaluation. So what does uh, evaluation look like for the disciplines of history as practiced at Gonzaga University? Well, what we read, we agreed that we had to have certain sort of parameters. And we agreed uh, three sets of goals. And we agreed, uh, looking at documents, that we want to embrace the goals of general education. We want to embrace the goals of history as a discipline. What does a wider community talk about history and what are those goals? And then specifically, the goals of teaching history within an Ignatian and Jesuit university. So we kind of looked at those three goals. Well, how did we, how did we talk about those three goals? And, and so three different um, uh, texts were identified. We took first the American Association of Colleges and Universities, Liberal Education and American's Promise. Many of you know that is the LEAP document. And we had a discussion on the text, Liberal Education Outcomes, the, meaning, the Learning Every Student Needs. And then LEAP identified the following as liberal education goals, and many of these you've seen knowledge of human culture in the natural world, science, social, mathematics, intellectual and practical skills, critical thinking, all that, you know. Individual and social responsibility, civic responsibility, ethical reasoning, all those goals that you're familiar with. And then we said, you know what? 
They look good to us. Go to the next one. So what specific and unique contributions can history make towards the implementation of those goals? So we read and discussed the, hi the history major and the undergraduate liberal education. We part of the National History Center Working Group to the Teagle Foundation. So the Teagle Foundation sponsored a document saying, what should history departments be doing? We read that. We discussed that at the beginning of this year. The results were good. We had a very good discussion. No one got hurt. We agreed with what was said in both sets of documents. But if we stopped at the criteria of these documents, what would make our efforts distinct? That is, what would identify us as contributing towards the school's Jesuit identity? Basically, we all agreed that the AACU documents were just great, but we want to stand out from the University of Minnesota or Iowa or any other school. We want to be different. And so to do that, we uh, examined a set of goals and we used that as a not my opinion of Jesuit education, not a specific Jesuit's opinion of Jesuit education, a document created by the Jesuit conference themselves called Communal Reflection on the Jesuit Mission in Higher Education, a way of proceeding. From that, we took those four goals and we discussed those, and those four goals in these documents, and I can send you if you're, uh, this document is in print, and it's also online. So dedication to human dignity from a Catholic Jesuit faith perspective, reverence for an ongoing reflection on human experience, creative compassion, uh, companionship with colleagues, and a focused care for students. We saw this as not only following in the footsteps of AACU, but somehow following in the footsteps of Ignatian education. Our current activities now to bring about those goals that we've identified has been creating a set of goals that are in line with the general consensus of the discipline, the LEAP document, the leading uh, liberal education in America's promise, those criteria uh, that are put out by the AACU. The Teagle Report on History in Undergraduate Liberal Education. What is the consensus in the field of discipline in the history? Then we looked at creating goals which express the values articulated in the communal reflection, those goals that make us distinct from every other AACU school. Our next our conversation, that's going to be part of our conversation as we talk about specific core courses, that's what we're going to do after this meeting, will be look at ways to establish best practices to achieve these goals in core classes, upper division classes, and those classes specific to the major working towards creative colleagueship and awareness of student needs so as to best implement these goals. And create tools of evaluation, evaluation in the sense of those criteria as established in document six of the general congregation to assure that we are achieving these goals. And then finally, continue our from masses and prayers that someday we may get a bigger office, perhaps with a window. <laughs> so, what are some of the concrete implementations of these goals and assessment tools that we're creating right now? What, are we, what have we done and what are we building on? First, uh, we had a history convocation. That's me. We had a history convocation where the goal of our progression of courses was explained. This goal, the order that we have in our introductory courses, in our 301, the, the uh, general uh, methods course, the upper division course, and then the capstone 401. What's the logic of this? Why do we have this progression? So we got all the history majors together and we said, here it is. And so this goal then itself, this, this synthetical goal then becomes an assessment goal in itself that then can be used as a tool for advising an individual student conversation. Are you getting the progression? Do you understand why we have the progression? Can we then use that as an outcomes assessment tool at the end of the major? Do you understand why we have this series of courses? We have embedded questions, which was sort of a holdover uh, from the, our initial uh, uh, interaction with the Teagle Grant. Embedded questions based on thematic questions uh, identified by the faculty, but also identified by Jesuit uh, concerns and everyone's concerns. Questions of justice, consumerism, power, gender. Okay, and then entry level and midterm program surveys to sort of document what's going on with the majors and then uh, the identification of specific skills criteria 
for example, my crusade on the advancement of the topic sentence. So, history will get you to learn, will help you learn from the past, so it'll get you through the present. Thank you so much. Do we, do we have questions? Okay. Speaking for our other pilot grant uh, department, chemistry is assistant professor Eric Ross. <laughs> Smattering of applause. So of course, um, in chemistry, we pronounce this, the acronym for the organization today, LED, not LEAD. Um, okay, so uh, the purpose of my presentation is to provide a brief description of the uh, assessment discourse that has really been spurred on by our participation in the TECL planning grant. And um, the planning grant had two parts. Uh, we conducted an activity uh, associated with the first one, which involved assessing our, our majors through embedded assignments. And the goal, as was stated in a TEGL summary paragraph from where I, I stole this next line, was to identify disciplinary outcomes to be assessed in an embedded assignment that would demonstrate student mastery of those outcomes. And so basically, as it was explained to me in successively simpler terms by uh, Michael Herzog, you collect student work, that's your data, you assess it, and you dis discuss, all right, reflect on that. So just prior to our participating in the grant, uh, the chemistry department had already uh, identified a learning outcome that we wanted to make uh, an assessment focus. Right? And that is number four from our departmental mission statement, student learning outcome and assessment plan, which every department has. Right? So um, this states that all of our majors will be able to demonstrate effective um, scientific communication um, in or orally and in writing. Okay? And our focus on this was due to the recognition that our seniors um, were demonstrating a, a trend of weakness in specific scientific writing skills. Right? And this was kind of alarming to us because they'd you know, been through the curriculum, they'd spent many years writing traditional lab reports, and so we wanted to remediate this. So uh, to get started, uh, we have to, of course, answer the direct or implicit question, what constitutes effective scientific writing? How would we recognize it? And um, an answer to this is a work in progress, but from our perspective, effective writing, of course, is the writing that, that we do, you know. We write effectively, chemists communicate effectively in many formats, but most importantly, in that of a scientific journal, how we commu communicate um, science. And um, this is a specific genre with the specific writing styles associated with it, and we want our students to be more than passingly familiar with it. So, um, let's see, where am I? Uh, a senior faculty member, um, with the help of a textbook that was being uh, pilot tested in our department, developed a rubric that focused on five areas of scientific writing listed here, all right, to provide us an intellectual framework um, from which we can categorize and explain student weaknesses and strengths in writing. Okay. So our Teagle activity uh, was to apply this rubric to the analysis of, of student writing. And we had a, a panel of faculty, four of them, um, analyze uh, a junior year writing assignment in the Unified Laboratory course. Um, this is a pretty hefty course. It's kind of the queen laboratory course in chemistry. The students spend eight hours a week in lab, several weeks on an individual project, and then they're expected to write about it in a scientific journal style. Okay, um, re really, uh, this is the first time in the curriculum where the students are expected to write in the scientific journal format for all sections of the lab report. Okay, to summarize the, the panel's findings, um, a majority of the faculty scored a majority of the students uh, very low, lowest or next to lowest, in several of the categories of the rubric, particularly in writing conventions and grammar and mechanics, and to some extent organization. And this really isn't surprising um, because arguably these areas, writing conventions and grammar mechanics, are the ones that require the most specific technical knowledge or the specific training to, to develop um, good writing skills. So um, a minority of our faculty scored the exact same students with the exact same rubric much higher. So that was somewhat surprising. Okay, so what kind of discourse um, was begotten from this? Well, um, our discussion is centered on remediation how-to, right? How strategically to better distribute 
specific writing instruction earlier in the curriculum, all right? Because students are not developing some of the specific skills that we want them to develop in a timely manner, if at all. And so uh, we are currently at the stage where we're experimenting tactically with types and frequencies of embedded assignments um, that are required to achieve this outcome. So on the topic of the same rubric, different result, uh, this is spawning a more general conversation about the rubric we're using and how the area should be weighted to achieve uh, specific outcomes. Uh, it basically, we surmise that it, it, it wasn't that the faculty couldn't identify student writing errors, it's just that uh, they were not using the rubric at face value. Okay, they were using their scoring to reflect their personal weightings uh, of the areas of the rubrics, they, what they thought was more important to the student writing. So the questions we're asking are, what value do we place on achieving this particular outcome, development of specific scientific writing skills in this genre? Um, how far are we willing to go to ensure that students master this? And what are the most important aspects uh, of scientific writing that we want our students to master? And we're trying to get a department-wide faculty discussion in on this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, our next four speakers come from the departments that are currently involved in the Teagle grant work. And David Boos, Associate Professor of Biology, uh, we'll begin by talking about that department's work. Thanks, Mike. Um, you'll notice some uh, significant parallels between the work that the chemistry department is doing and the work that the biology department is doing. Um, I have to say that happens mostly by osmosis. We occupy the same building. Um, not to just use a biological term there, but uh, um, we have conversations. Uh, we're we're uh, looking at some of the same skill development, approaching it slightly differently, but it's interesting to have uh, both of these processes going on in the same building and, and seeing how they overlap. Uh, the structure of the biology major is fairly uh, rigid, at least at the beginning, so we expect all of our students, we require all of our students to take the same uh, eight course core sequence, which has four biology courses and four chemistry courses in the first two years. So all the students are taking the same courses in the same order. After they've completed that, then they go on to choose from any of the upper division biology courses that they want in order to get sufficient credits to meet the requirements of the major. We also have a junior level, a 300 level, and a 400 level seminar course that are required of, of all the students. Um, for a number of years, we've been using a comprehensive exam in our 400 level seminar course as an assessment of content knowledge. We used the uh, graduate record exam, the GRE, for a while. We have switched um, probably eight years or more ago now to the biology major field test, which is designed to be more of an outcome assessment, but really still just measures uh, content knowledge. And so one of the things that we have been wanting to address is the development of the skills uh, both in intellectual skills and practical skills of being a scientist. So uh, through the grant from the Teagle Foundation, um, we wanted to focus specifically on students' ability to design, carry out, analyze, and then write up a scientific experiment. So again, similar to the chemistry department, looking at those skills that really are uh, what scientists do professionally. Um, they do this in different ways and to different degrees at various stages in the curriculum already. So for example, uh, in our 101 class first semester, they have a small project that they do in lab, uh, which they then write up a portion of what would be a normal scientific paper. So they might write up just the methods section, for example. So we, we do some progressive building of these skills. At the end of the sophomore year, in our genetics and evolution class, about half of the semester in the lab portion of the course is devoted to independent research projects. These are projects that students do uh, with the guidance and supervision of faculty members, but they are uh, left much to their own devices in terms of actually determining which questions they're asking, the methods they're going to use, the data they collect. And those projects, uh, to the extent possible, tie in with faculty research interests in the department, and then those faculty help to supervise those projects. So that's when they're really, we, we loosen the reins a lot at the end of that sophomore year and allow them to actually have a lot of independence in, in designing and writing up scientific papers or uh, scientific experiments. In many of our upper division classes, which also have laboratory portions, there is also uh, a, a more advanced type of independent project. 
So what we realized as we started these discussions is that we have the opportunity to make comparison and actually look for growth in our students' skills between the sophomore year, for example, and the senior year. So what we have decided to do is to compare student papers, and ideally we will compare the same student's papers from sophomore year to an upper division course, uh, and using a standard rubric, evaluate those uh, much in the same way that the chemistry department is thinking about doing. So you have a standard rubric where you're evaluating these papers and then comparing how the students score at the sophomore year to how they compare uh, in the junior or senior year in these upper division classes. Um, and the idea would be that we would look, we'd be looking for growth in uh, these different areas. And we identified uh, our several members of our working group in the department spent several days at a workshop sponsored by the Teagle Foundation this summer in which they developed this rubric and spent a lot of time in figuring out what are the components of the scientific writing and then within each of those components what makes excellent writing, what is okay and what is really not acceptable. Um, and we actually we don't use the term not acceptable, but you know, at development. So we have a developmental continuum along there. We would expect that those papers at the sophomore year would uh, score relatively low on that rubric because students are still developing those skills. We would hope then that we would see significant improvement between then and the senior year when we compare those uh, papers. The way we're going to implement this is through a, a digital portfolio. So here's where the sort of, you notice I don't have a PowerPoint presentation and yet we're sort of trying to work some technological magic here. This part is still uh, in very much in process. Um, but the idea is that students will develop and maintain a digital portfolio of their work that they will keep through their career in the biology department so that by the time they become seniors, we will be able to actually have them submit to us a paper from one of their upper division laboratory classes and their genetics independent project from their sophomore year. And we would have those two documents and be able to compare on an individual basis for growth. So we might not see, we, we might have some students who start out at a very rudimentary level in their skills and they might not be at the top level uh, by the time they get to their senior year, but if we've seen growth in those skills, we'll be happy with that. So we'd like to be able to evaluate that on an individual basis. How we actually do that is still being worked out, but um, this, our next step is we're actually starting to gather papers from students. We did develop this rubric this summer, and so the next step is to actually test the rubric by evaluating some papers similar to what the chemistry department did and, and look for the problems that are going to come up in terms of consistency of scoring, how are we actually going to rate these papers, and so that'll open up another whole can of worms, but that's where we are. Thank you. There we go. I was thinking while I was listening to the other presentations that this will be strange. I have, it's been a long time since I've spoken to such a large group from so far away. And I hope you don't mind if I move a little closer. I feel a little more comfortable that way. Um, we have been interested in the psychology department for quite some time with ensuring that our students graduate with a solid foundation in scientific method. And it's this concern that has driven our interest in assessment. What I'm going to talk about today are these three topics. First, I'll describe our objectives. This is kind of a profile of what we'd like to see in our students when they graduate. Second, I will give you a sketch, and I emphasize the term sketch because this is a work in progress, of how we hope to assess this. And I'll conclude with a few thoughts about what we need to do next, because as I said, this is definitely a work in progress. Our objectives fall into three categories. The first category is knowledge, and uh, we expect our students to graduate with a broad knowledge across the field of psychology, also with an understanding of the ethical principles that are involved in research and in clinical practice. Scientific fluency is our second cluster. We expect our students to have a solid understanding of scientific method and also how to apply scientific method. And our third objective is presentation. We expect our students to graduate with the ability to write clear, well-organized papers in American Psychological Association format, and also to be able to present 
information verbally at con uh, conferences and in conjunction with poster sessions. So how do we do that? Well, right now, just like biology, we are assessing the knowledge objectives using either the graduate record exam, subject uh, psychology subject test, or preferably with the psychology major field test. We like that one because it's cheaper, uh, students can take it more than once, and in addition, it gives us uh, reports by subarea rather than just one composite. Now, that serves for the knowledge objectives, but there's a problem when you start talking about the uh, scientific fluency and the presentation objectives, because there the most important thing is that the student be able to do something. And we needed a way to assess that. Well, we borrowed from biology. They mentioned the portfolios at one of our meetings, and our ears perked up, and we thought, this might do what we want to do. So we've developed a plan based upon that, and I'll describe it briefly. Our first step, which is in progress, is to develop some guidelines for these embedded assignments. Generally, we want our students to, in their upper division courses, to uh, research the literature, evaluate the literature, suggest a research topic, and describe an experiment to test that idea. Um, so we're working on that. The second thing is the portfolios. The writing assignments would become part of a portfolio. And finally, toward the end, we would take samples from the portfolios and use this um, as an assessment tool. Now, of course, there's quite a bit left to do to make this work, so I'll talk about some of these once, once, what's next topics. The first one is to write the guidelines for uh, the embedded assignments. We actually don't think this is going to be too difficult. We suspect that most people in the department are already doing what we need to do. So about all we need to do is just put this down on paper so we don't forget it sometime in the future. The second part is the instructions for the portfolios. We need to work this out. We need to decide what to include when to start the portfolios, and we also need to decide on their form. Now, the biology department is looking at electronic, but we've left that open for the moment. It could be a brown paper bag from the supermarket. It's more likely to be something electronic, but we'll decide on that as we assess this a little bit farther. The third thing we need to work on is our assessment procedures, and this is probably where most of the work is going to fall. We need to decide how we're going to assess, in other words, how we're going to take our samples from a portfolio, uh, who's going to do the assessment, how often we're going to do these assessments, and so on. And in addition, we need to establish our assessment criteria, and I envision us developing some sort of an assessment guide with a variety of sub-areas similar to what biology has suggested, uh, and um, a rating scale for each one, and I would imagine that probably in the end our measure will be something like a proportion of students who meet the standard in a particular sub-area. We'll have to work on that. Finally, we have to discuss two topics that aren't included yet. Um, there's an ethics objective, and there's also a verbal presentation objective, and we presently do not have a way to assess either one of these, so we're going to have to think about that a little bit. In conclusion, I would like to thank the people that have made contributions to this. Um, we've sat in quite a few meetings discussing things with history, biology, music, and we much appreciate the contributions. I've mentioned the contributions of biology. Uh, the music department made some important contributions, history, and other departments as well. We really appreciate. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Uh, our next presenter is Assistant Professor Jeff Miller, who will be speaking on behalf of the English Department's work. Hi. So at the outset, I should probably say that I think David and I are most authentically walking in the footsteps of Ignatius Loyola because we're not using PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> so I won't be needing this. Uh, <clears throat> so. Hello. Beginning this year, uh, English majors are no longer required to take English 201 Studies in Poetry um, as the last course, uh, last required course before going on to upper division courses. 
what we affectionately in English call the ramp to the English major. Now, any 200 level literature course, including a number of new offerings, can serve as this ramp. <clears throat> and as we were considering this change, we had a number of conversations about how we thought our 200 level courses might prepare our majors to be majors. And what skills in particular uh, does this ramp need to cultivate in order to help our students attain proper emerging speed for upper division courses? Sometimes we're accused of being overly fond of metaphor in English, so bear with me. Um, <clears throat> so the Teagle Grant has allowed us to um, continue this conversation and eventually to focus on one particular skill that we hope is being cultivated in these courses. Um, so there are obviously a number of things we want our majors to be able to do, um, including being able to read literature critically and analyze those works in conventionally appropriate ways, to construct and articulate competent and persuasive interpretations and arguments about texts, uh, to close read literary texts, discerning both meaning and the ways that it's created, and also communicate that reading using the vocabulary of literary studies. But as we were talking, we found that there was one skill that seemed to be a prerequisite for all these other skills. And it's so foundational, in fact, that it's often the first thing that the ideal English major does, and does continually while reading. And it's simply asking discipline-appropriate questions about a literary text. Who is the speaker of this poem? Why does he have miles to go before he sleeps? To what extent is the Hegelian master-slave dialect reflected in the speaker's relationship with his horse? <laughs> that, that may actually be the ideal uh, double major in history and philosophy. Um, <clears throat> Anyway, questions like these, right? And when an experienced major reads, this kind of questioning happens continually, often intuitively, um, and it allows all these other things to happen. All the other goals we have are a result of that, uh, the basic skill of asking these questions continually of a literary text. And so uh, if the skill uh, that's so foundational to our work in English, then our, our Teagle question becomes, to what extent do these 200 level courses teach that skill? And as is the case uh, with some other disciplines in arts and sciences with significant core contributions, none of our lower division classes are exclusive to our majors. And especially with our new broader requirements for our major, um, our students then, our English students, are diffused widely throughout these 200 level of uh, courses. And in any one of those courses, the majority of the students are not gonna be English majors. Thus our Teagle question becomes, how well can these students ask discipline appropriate questions about a literary text like English majors, even if they are not English majors? So our project then became a way to find, um, became a way to find, uh, try that again, became how to find a way to assess uh, all these students and by extension, uh, all these 200 level literature courses. So at the uh, Teagle workshop this summer um, that some of us up here have been talking about, we developed a brief assignment um, that we feel will assess our 200 level students using a, a pre-test and a post-test model. We offer the same assignment, um, well a version of the same assignment in week one and week 15 and we're currently piloting this assignment in some of our 200 level uh, classes. Essentially the assignment provides a brief poem uh, relevant to the course and um, gives students a, a finite time limit, I believe it was 20 minutes, um, and asks the students to read that poem and craft a question about it that they'd like to discuss with other readers and then explore possible answers to that question. So there's no other framing or instructions that go on. We don't try to guide them and explain you know, what a relevant question is or um, you know, how this might lead you to interpretations or writing a competent um, essay about, this, uh, about the poem. We just give them that very simple directive, give them the poems, and then they, they have their time to uh, respond or doodle in the margins. Um, I got a couple of those. Um, so um, our next steps now, we hope to, to today um, in our departmental time, is to review some of these pilot responses and begin to develop a rubric for, for uh, assessing them and then hopefully move towards uh, um, implementing this assignment in, in a, a broader uh, range of those courses. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Our final speaker this morning is Father Gary Yulencott, Associate Professor and Chair of the Music Department. In the Music Department, this has been very valuable for us, the Teagle thing. We were a little reluctant because um, but then we got into it this summer. 
And uh, I agree with Gary too. The ideas that we came away with from other departments was incredible, and we weren't thinking in the same way. We're going through a process now. It's a two-year process of going for NASM, the National Association of Schools of Music. We're going for accreditation, and that's a two-year process. And you know, all of you that have gone through accreditation, you know how grueling that can be in the paper trail you have to leave. And so we're starting that out. So this process has really just leaped us way ahead for stuff that we would have to do anyway. And it was a nice way for us to cross-pollinate with other departments and to look at different ideas and to kind of clean up what we already have. We assess our students, our music majors. We have um, music major um, in composition, performance, and general studies. And then we also have music education major. They're assessed all the time uh, in the performance area. So we've been doing that for years. Um, the uh, music major has to do a recital every semester. And they also have to do a jury or an assessment in front of a number of faculty members every semester. That just goes on. So there are, we constantly have an assessment uh, of them. In order for a music performance major or music education major to get into upper division applied lessons, which they have to do, they have to audition to get into upper division lessons. So they just stay down at the bottom until they can leap up the front. It's one way of our, um, our kind of cutting off and saying that you're not ready to do this. We don't want to put anybody out there that's not competent in, on their instrument. We also have um, a junior and senior recital, which they have to do, and they have to audition before they do the recital, a month before they do with the recital. And at that time, they are graded for the recital itself at the audition. So in the performance area, we have been assessing students for years and years. That's not our problem. So this is going to add some consistency to it, what we judge on, and, and the instruments will refine the instruments. The one thing that's been very valuable in this process for us was doing embedded assignments in the theory, or the, what we call the academic courses. Music majors have to take four semesters of lower division theory. Music minors have to take two semesters of lower division theory. At the end of the second semester, we will assess them, and we're refining that instrument. So we will cover all of our majors and all of our minors. At the end of theory four, which is the end of the lower division theory sequence, we will that will basically be music majors at that point. Well, we, we will use basically the same instrument to assess them again. And then uh, they have to take three semesters of music history, and one of those semesters we will assess them in the music history area. And then in the upper division music uh, theory, like composition, orchestration, or counterpoint, they will be assessed one more time. So that's been very valuable. We didn't have that in place, and so it's really embedded, and we, then we'll have an ongoing record of it. But as I, I just can't stress enough how happy we are with the process that has gone on, um, and especially in light of the fact that we're going for NASM accreditation, and it's just been very, very valuable for us. I want to just thank very much uh, our colleagues who have been working on this project and who continue to work on it, and especially our presenters today. I also wanted to say thank you to the AVP staff and especially Mayor Ann Rinderly who made all this happen this morning. And thank you to those who helped plan this day, uh, Tina Geithner, Dan Bubb, Patricia Terry, Jim Vache, and uh, Yolanta Kazira. Uh, the Teagle Grant calls for all departments in arts and sciences to have the opportunity to do this kind of thinking. And I'm currently getting ready to ask five of the remaining departments to participate in next year's cycle. I hope that the presentations today and the variety of approaches that you've heard to thinking about this uh, encourage faculty from eligible departments to take an interest in this work and look forward to hearing from you about that interest. What we're asking you to do now is to spend the next hour or two hours or so in your own areas working on whatever outcomes assessment uh, projects you are undertaking for the year. And then we hope to see you back here at noon for lunch and some closing remarks from our acting academic vice president, Earl Martin. Again, thanks for being here this morning and for taking this work seriously.